There are now a number of different ways to create footers depending on the effect that you're going for. So uh, you can have uh, footers that attach to the bottom of the, uh, let's see, where are we here? This one. So notice this is the kind of footer using the same old footer hint that was always available in SiteGrinder, the footer background hint or footer background color is actually what was used here. Notice that it always sits at the bottom of the browser window. In this case, we uh, we uh, this is demonstrating the fixed hint, so it floats above the content. But if this were using the footer hint instead, you would see sort of the traditional site grinder footer that always sticks to the bottom of the browser window, um, uh, even when the window is taller than the content. But what if we wanted something to appear at the end of content of the page, not at the end at the bottom of the browser window? Well, let's look at how we used to do that in Photoshop. So prior to SiteGrinder 3.5, the way that you created a footer uh, that kind of followed after the end of a page's content was to create your footer layers. So here we have, uh, I'm just using a panel for this, and I've got some text in front of it and a little horizontal line. So these three layers make up what I'm essentially using as a kind of footer. It's something that I just, it's some generic thing that I want to have on multiple pages and I want to have it come right up to the bottom of my content. Um, in SiteGrinder, in versions prior to 3.5, the way we did this was we manually positioned it in each layer comp, which, which was a bit laborious. So uh, we would have to make the layer comps track position. So each layer comp would have to be told to track position. And then in each layer comp, we would have to move this footer thing uh, up to follow after the bottom of our content. SiteGrinder 3.5 introduces what we call the follow hint. And the follow hint makes this effect a lot easier. Uh, basically, it allows you to just stick the uh, sort of footer content one place, usually at the very bottom of your document, and then after SiteGrinder builds, the built pages will have the follow uh, layer automatically move up to bump up against the bottom of your content. So let's go ahead and look at that. Uh, so what we're going to do here, and again, all the, these are also example files from, uh, in this case, the footer documentation page, so you can download and play with these. Both the before, the old way, and the new way uh, are available. So let's do the basic uh, Let's see, where is it? Basic following footer. All right, now let's take a look at how these pages are laid out. So notice that in both of these cases, we have uh, each page has a different amount of content, but in, on both pages, we just stuck these footer layers uh, at the bottom of the page. And in this case, they don't even use the footer hint. It's a panel that's going to, again, think, think about this, this gray panel layer in the background is going to create a panel consisting of what? those layers that are in front of it and that fit inside it. So that's this hairline layer and that's this uh, address right here. So these will be our uh, panel contents. By putting the follow hint on it, notice it does not use the footer hint. Uh, it's, we're, we're sort of creating a kind of footer without bothering with the footer hint by using the follow hint. And just as a reminder, the follow hint will cause this to follow after the bottom of the page content. So it will not stick to the bottom of the browser window when the browser window is taller than the content. It will jump up. It will it will essentially eliminate this gap automatically. And, and that's handy because that gap is different on each page. Um, that's not unusual that each page on a website has a different amount of unique content followed by some footery chunk. And that's what's going on here. So let's look at the built version after we look, just take again a look at these two pages. One is uh, shorter text, one is longer text, and neither of them has this follow layer manually positioned at the end. But if we go to the browser and we take a look at these two pages, notice that page two has the footer down here page one, the footer has jumped up to be at the end of this content. So it's basically another convenience hint. Um, it's not doing anything that was impossible before with SiteGrinder. It just allows you to do it more easily and automatically. 
Um, and it, it is a pretty pretty common request that we've had is for something that can be smart about the amount of content and instead of drawing everything way down at the bottom of the browser window we'll actually just jump up and come after the end of the pages content so um, uh, just a handy handy feature there um, now what I'd like to move on to is uh, just a, re a reminder this is a an old school uh, footer that you could make with uh, prior to SiteGrinder 3.5, but it's an example that's now available on the footer uh, documentation page. And what it's showing is that you can have layers that are outside of the footer. And notice how they're considered to be unimportant from a content standpoint. The way you can tell that is that they're disappearing as I make my, my browser window narrower. You could imagine uh, if this little uh, thought balloon over here were uh, important, you wouldn't want it to disappear off the side as you shrink the window. But because it's just sort of decoration, notice what happens when we get to the stuff that is important, then suddenly it stops shrinking. And now the thing that's on the, the right disappears. And so this is using a page size layer. I'm not going to get into this uh, too much because this is not a Cycle under 3.5 specific feature, but it is a really cool feature that's now documented. This is a sample file you can download from the uh, footer page, and it's just yet another footer thing that you can do that's very cool. Um, so uh, let's move on to Google Fonts. Uh, Google Fonts are a way of, as you may already know, addressing the problem that uh, custom fonts are really fun to use in design when used judiciously. Um, but if you're not sure that the person who's going to be viewing your design has that font installed, you can't really use it very easily uh, on a web page because you, what, you, what you need is some kind of system that noticed that the font was not installed, um, installed the font essentially for the purposes of that web page to use, and then rendered it along with the page. Well, Google has invented a, a great system for doing this that gets over another big hurdle of this. Uh, one of the reasons this took so long uh, before it became uh, a, a sort of feature of the internet is the the font foundries were, as you can imagine, throwing a fit about how were they going to make money. Um, you know, if somebody downloaded uh, one of their wonderful fonts, they wanted to get royalties every time that happened, and suddenly that just created a huge nightmare of how are we possibly going to be able to, to deal with this both legally and technically. So Google got around the legal hurdle by basically having infinite money. So they don't care about getting paid every time you download one of their fonts. So they've got this huge library of fonts that's entirely public domain. Then they also created a technical underpinning that allows those fonts to be downloaded by browsers that support this system um, and uh, used on your page. So um, there's a lot going on in the background, both legally and technically. But luckily, with SiteGrinder, you don't need to know about any of that. Basically, for you to use a Google font with SiteGrinder 3.5 uh, involves two steps. You go download that font from Google for free and install it on your computer. And then you use that font just like you use any other font on your web design, and SiteGrinder does the rest. Um, now let's just quickly go over how you get a Google font. Um, Google makes uh, an incorrect assumption that people using Google fonts are pretty technical. So um, uh, let's just kind of, they don't make it super obvious how to download these fonts. So I'm just going to quickly kind of go through how you do that. The quickest way to do it is just Google Google fonts. And the first thing that comes up is this Google Web Fonts page. So let's go there. And we have a selection of fonts here. There are 293 font families available. Um, you can browse by category. You can uh, thickness, slant, width, script, all of this stuff. And when you find a font that you like, you can click this Add to Collection button. And what you'll do is you'll gradually build up a collection of fonts. Maybe it'll just be different styles of the same font, or maybe it will be a, a, a whole set of completely different fonts. And uh, once you've created a collection, and I'll go ahead and let's add this one. And we'll scroll down and we'll add this one. 
Once you've uh, created your collection, you want to go to the Use button. And when you go to the Use button, uh, you can uh, get various technical chunks that you don't need. But what's important here is this little Download Your Collection. When you click that, you will download, uh, I believe, a zip file with basically just true type fonts in it. And you just install those fonts in your system the way you normally do. Just on a Mac, for example, you can just double click them and it'll open up Font Book and you can install the font. And that font will then be available. I believe you have to quit Photoshop before Photoshop will notice. But uh, you run Photoshop again and you'll see the font listed in your fonts menu. And literally, that's it. So uh, here we can see in the Design Manager a built page that has this funky font in it. Now that font happens to be uh, installed on my machine, but if you view this page and you don't have this font, you'll still see the font if you're using a reasonably modern browser. And uh, we do document uh, in the documentation wiki exactly which browsers uh, support Google Fonts, or you can just Google it. That information is very freely available. Just type in what browsers do Google Fonts work on, and you'll quickly get an answer. But anyway, the bottom line is, line is if you're using any sort of modern browser, you will see uh, this text in its actual Google Font. Um, the caveats here are, as with anything, um, discretion is the better part of valor. You do not want to fill up your page and make it look like some you know, bake sale announcement from 1988 after somebody got a laser printer. Um, you know, you want to, uh, you know, from a design standpoint, um, obviously the principle of fewer fonts is better is generally the case. Um, also, uh, every font you use is another chunk of download and delay while uh, the browser renders the page. So if you use a ton of fonts, uh, you can end up um, creating a, a, a lot of download time for a page.